Hi, welcome back to the channel. This is Dr. Walker from denwalker.com. Uh, I thought I'd talk a little today about uh, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, the VERA system. Uh, that is a system that um, when individuals have complication posts sort or of anything uh, medical, uh, they can upload their information in terms of essentially saying what the adverse event uh, is all about. And then some person will look at that data and say, well, this is related to uh, specifically vaccine or other things to say, this is likely related to or not related to related to um, the medication of the drug. Anyway, so for the last couple of weeks, I've uh, been discussing and talking to people, random folks, about um, about the system, what they understood the system to mean, and how they sort of uh, interacted with the system on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, now, this is this is not to say that what I'm about to say is definitely associated with the vaccine, nor am I trying to. Um, justify what happens in, in in medicine not what i'm trying to do i'm tr simply trying to say what i understand the system to be and sort of how people should perhaps uh use the data that they get especially from the news um when they hear it so again over the last couple of weeks what i'm what i've done is i've talked to people and some of the things that came up uh in my discussion with folks uh, included things like uh autoimmune episcleritis, which is where you're sort of getting inflammation or um, a problem between the conjunctiva and the sclera, the white part of your eyes, one. Two, um, people with uh, type 1 diabetes, new onset, uh, within, within a month of the vaccine. The other one uh, was DBTs, um, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and perhaps the worst case I've heard in the last week, in the last two weeks, uh, worst case I heard was a gentleman who was 28 years old, and um, he was within two weeks of getting the vac getting his vaccine, and uh, he ended up with an ejection fraction uh, of 15 percent. That's one five percent. Now normal is about greater than 50 percent. Some people say 55 percent. So in other words, how well your heart squeezes uh, with these contraction of the heart to push the blood out. So he is 20 years old, 28 years old, and he ended up with um, an ejection fraction, which again, in 20 years, I probably see this maybe maybe a, a dozen times or so. I, I, you, you see this kind of, this number. Uh, and I never, I've never seen it in a person who was, uh, I'd say less than 40, right? So sometimes you can get these, um, what we call some cardiomyopathies or some event that causes damage to the heart muscle, and you, you'll end up in this scenario, but I've never seen it in a person who was sub 30. Um, and I do a lot of uh, nuclear cardiac imaging um, daily, right? And and again, I, so I see these numbers essentially every day, and I, I've never seen this uh, before. Also, the other thing I was gonna say that I've never seen before, I've seen some of the, recently, some of the largest uh, pericardial effusion, so fluid that's around the heart itself in young people, specifically people who are under 40 years old. I, I've never seen uh, this degree, this amount of fluid in, in these individuals. I've never seen it. Anyway, so I'm talking to providers about their experience with the various system. And um, much of it, you know, circled around sort of these things that I, I, I talked about a second ago. And I listened to what they have what they have to say about these conditions. Um, one person said to me, you know, there's a, a case of a stroke that I talked with her, with her about uh, three weeks ago. So uh, she was talking about a stroke in a person who is um, had no prior medical significant medical history. She ends up with a stroke, and uh, the doctor said to me, and I quote do you think this might be vaccine related? Um, and I said, well, um, does she have any other significant concerns? She said, no, but you know, it's been two months out and I've never seen data to suggest that things can happen to an individual two months after the, um, after the vaccine. And I thought, well, you know, I, I don't know, but I can't take anything off the table, which is what I think most of us should do. If we can't, we, if we don't know we can't say, for example, some things, specifically vaccine, for example, uh, is not definitely not related until we've done sort of the investigation, until we've done until we've done the um, the query. Anyway, so um, 
each of these things I mentioned a second ago, when I, in, in the discussion somewhere, I'd say to them, um, so have you input this data in the various system? And invariably I get this very puzzled look. Um, one person said to me, and I quote, you, don't, you know I don't have time for that. Now, I'll tell you this, if you were to call sort of to get an appointment, a general routine appointment, most cases across, uh, especially where we live, you would get probably at least if not a couple of days out in terms of the next available appointment available to you to maybe a week or two or even longer out. And the reason is that providers are, are, are busy. And again, I'm not trying to justify what they're not doing, right? I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. I'm telling you what the process is and how things, how things work. So the next available appointment for a routine exam is typically a day or two or maybe three days out. And the reason is some places they'll have um, scheduled patients every 15 or so minutes. And, and that's for the day. Some people have upwards of 60, pa 60 patients per day. Now this is sort of pre-pandemic as well, right? These numbers I'm talking about. So let's say that we had two or three patients coming in a day to get uh to get whatever done but a part of their complaint now is that they have you know episcleritis or they have shortness of breath or they have possibly you know a dbt i think most doctors are essentially treating patients for the condition that they present with however um on my research it tells me that it takes about 40 minutes or so to actually complete one of the, uh, to com or submit uh, information into the various system. So most people, doctors, um, would imply or tell me essentially, the ones I talk with, that they don't have time. They don't have time because already they're busy. Some people are coming in an hour early, leaving an hour late. And then you just say to them, that individual, hey, you need to go ahead and add another two 40 minute appointments in your day somewhere to upload information to the very system. My point is that although the intent of the system is great, right? The intent of the system is when you have a complication with a vaccine or with whatever, you're supposed to upload the data into the system so that it can be tracked and some person can actually determine whether or not this is associated with the uh, medication or vaccine. The intent is great, but I, I don't know that individuals, providers specifically, have the time allocated to do what is always right in this scenario. So the reason I'm saying this is I worry that the number of events that's reported in the system is underreported. So in other words, when uh, the CDC says, you know, the risk of myocarditis in a person less than 40 is 2.5, you know, per 100,000, I'm not sure how, how accurate that is. I'm not certain that it's actually reflected of the true value in the system in that I don't know that people, providers, um, are actually spending the time, and again, not trying to blame anyone, um, but they oftentimes do not have that time to submit the information. I think what they're trying to do is take care of the patient from a standpoint of whatever the condition is they're presented with, taking care of those patients and essentially send them on their way, right? Be because they're, 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 they're busy. Uh, and again, not justifying it, but that's what the reality of the situation is. I worry that the number of events that we are seeing in the system is under four. Now, I, I think Harvard did a study a few years ago, essentially saying that um, maybe 10% of complications actually make it into the virus system. I, I worry now in this pandemic, it's actually less than that. But, but again, I have no data to support this. Um, I have not done any specific research on that, but I worry just based on what I'm, people I'm talking with, people I'm having the discussion with, I worry that that number is significantly under underreported. Anyway, that's my thought on on this whole thing. I, I just I just worry that you know when when we say oh it's it's not so bad or the numbers aren't so bad or uh, you know no one's no one sort of it's not been reported in the system anywhere. I would take caution with those. Uh, with that information, with those numbers. Just just take caution with them. Think about them a little bit more. Anyway, um, again, if you like what we're doing on this channel, denwalker.com, please go ahead and subscribe for us and go ahead and let uh, folks know what we're, what we're trying to do. Uh, my goal is to help people 
stay safe in this uh, pandemic. Um, eat right, walking, hydration, nutrition, all of that stuff. That's what I'm trying to get uh, for get done for these folks. And if you have, um, if, if people are waiting for, you know, the vaccine or waiting to see what happens with the vaccine long term, some things that uh, they should consider also in terms of how to keep themselves safe uh, until they're ready to get their, get their vaccine. Anyway, thanks for listening, Dr. Walker. God bless.